Hi, I'm Dr. Kelly Wachowicz, one of the attending physicians at CS Mott Children's Hospital in the Division of Pediatric Hematology and Oncology. Today I was asked to speak with you regarding the newest addition to the Michigan Newborn Screening Program, the ability to test for T-cell deficiencies. As many of you know, currently the state tests for over 50 different disorders ranging from sickle cell disease to cystic fibrosis to multiple metabolic disorders. In October 2011, the TREC assay, the actual test that tests for T-cell deficiencies, was added. Before I begin the formal discussion, I just need to mention that I have no relevant disclosures or conflicts of interest. The discussion outlined today will focus on four main areas. One will be an awareness of T-cell deficiencies and a review of T-cell maturation. The second will be how the actual newborn screen identifies this subgroup of patients with possible T-cell deficiencies and how the TREC assay itself is performed in the clinical laboratory setting. Third is, once you have a positive TREC assay, what is the referral process for patients and families? And finally, what are the initial care recommendations for families with a newborn infant who have a screening test that is positive with the TREC assay? From the public perception, the most famous case of T-cell deficiency is the case of David Vetter. He was born in Texas in 1971 into a family with an older sister who was healthy, but he also had an older brother who passed away at seven months of age due to a faulty thymus. That faulty thymus was identified later to be due to a defect in the common gamma chain, which is one of the classifications of severe combined immunodeficiency. Because of the parents' experience with the older brother, precautions were taken with David, such that whenever he was born within 10 seconds of his birth, he was placed into a germ-free plastic bubble with plans for him to undergo a rapid bone marrow transplant from his sister. However, there was a problem because his sister, unfortunately, was not a match, and the plan for bone marrow transplant was not able to be held. Therefore, he was maintained in his bubble long term. As part of this experience, everything that went into the bubble um, for his life had to be very carefully sterilized with an intense process that involved exposure to ethylene oxide for four hours at 140 degrees Fahrenheit and then an aeration period of one to seven days. As you might imagine, this caused great emotional stress for the family, and by the age of 12 years, they had elected to utilize his sister as a bone marrow transplant donor despite the recognized mismatches. The transplant was actually well tolerated, but a few months later, David developed fever, diarrhea, vomiting, and intestinal bleeding. Ultimately, he was taken out of his bubble for further medical care and died two weeks later of Burkitt's lymphoma. Now, the problem for us really is not necessarily single cases of immune deficiency, particularly whenever there are families who have a prior history, but recognizing kids who don't have a family history of T cell deficiency. And there are multiple ways that a child can present. And the question often is, which child has a T-cell deficiency? For A, is it a five-month-old boy with recurrent viral URIs, diarrhea, and a failure to gain weight? B, a 12-year-old girl with tetany and no appreciable thymic shadow and chest X-ray? C, a 20-month-old boy with a history of granulomatous skin infections, pneumonia after the Prevnar vaccine, and disseminated varicella after receiving the varicella vaccine? D, a one-week-old boy with no documented infections but an absolute lymphocyte count of 2,800, or E, a six-week-old girl with persistent lacy rash. The truth is that all five of those, A through E, could have a severe combined immunodeficiency. In the case of A, the five-month-old boy is a common presentation for generic combined immunodeficiency as they often present with recurrent unrelenting diarrhea and recurrent viral infections particularly as they approach the six-month age when the maternal IgG is waning. And B is a classic case of DeGeorge syndrome. C demonstrates the fact that many of these children have difficulty handling normal immunization patterns and often receive some form of disease after the vaccines. D, while at first glance looks like an appropriate healthy child, the ALC is not an appropriate level. For infants within the first few weeks of life, their ALC should be greater than 3,500. And this is notable because it is quite different from an adult's standard values. E, the six-week-old girl with a lacy persistent rash, could merely have a viral infection. However, a lacy rash that refuses to go away in combination with other symptoms could also be an indicator of maternal T-cell engraftment, which is a problem that children with severe combined immunodeficiency are susceptible to. 
To understand how exactly the new newborn screen works, we first need to take a step back and look at the basic T cell development. T cells are derived from pluripotent hematopoietic stem cells in the bone marrow that then migrate to the thymus for maturation. The T in T cells literally stands for thymus, as these T cells are thymus-dependent lymphocytes. The maturation depends on four key steps, the first of which is the activation of NOTCH1 to commit the lymphocyte progenitor cells to a T cell lineage. The second is the T cell receptor alpha and beta rearrangement of the DJ and the VDJ regions. This second step here is the key step that the TREK assay takes advantage of. Three is the period of intense proliferation followed by massive apoptosis as each T cell undergoes intense screening for achievement of self-tolerance. And then the fourth and final step is a migration of these T cells out of the thymus to the periphery for further antigen-dependent maturation and a commitment to either a CD4 positive or CD8 positive lineage. To take a closer look at the T cell receptor gene rearrangement for the TREK assay, you'll notice that there are three main regions, the V, the D, and the J. Those regions need to rearrange in order for the T cell to uh, function properly and to recognize its antigen. As that process undergoes, there is a movement of that DNA such that the end result demonstrates a linear fragment, which is the actual T cell rearrangement, as well as a byproduct, which is literally a circular piece of DNA that's pinched off. Those circles are what we refer to as treks, and that is what gives the name to the trek assay. These treks are important because they are only generated from cells that have recently emigrated from the thymus and are an indicator of the presence of a thymus and a presence of functionally appropriately maturing T cells. TREK itself stands for T cell receptor excision circles. And as mentioned, they are a byproduct of a normal T cell maturation and a marker of a successful development of a diverse T cell repertoire. Thus, the absence or near absence of TREKs in the peripheral blood is considered characteristic of severe T cell deficiency and possible SCIDs. Many would ask that while we have the ability to do the TREK assay, is it an appropriate newborn screen? Based on the state of Wisconsin's data, we have several questions which have answers. Many newborn screening programs will pose the question, does disease have a prevalence of more than 100,000? And yes, the prevalence of SCIDs or other severe T cell deficiencies is 1 in 66,000 people. The other question is, can it be detected in some other way without a particular laboratory test, such as by physical exam? The answer is no. Many SCIDS babies and T cell deficient babies look quite normal on physical exam. Also, the rest of the newborn screening tests are done off a blood spot card called a Guthrie card, and it's always pertinent to ask whether this new testing can be added directly to that Guthrie card or will it require the addition of additional tubes or other testing. The dry blood spot on the Guthrie card is sufficient for the TREK assay. And all forms of SCID have some sort of T cell deficiency. And as a side bonus, many other conditions have an impairment in T cell deficiency that are able to be picked up through this test. The other big issue is cost. It is estimated that this cost will only add about $6 to the newborn screen. In the state of Michigan, it appears to be $7 at present. And while that may initially seem like a lot, the data from the state of Wisconsin, which was the first state to implement the check assay, gathered that it costs $2.2 million to treat one SCIDS baby that is identified later in life, as opposed to $250,000 when they are diagnosed and treated up front. Thus, the identification of one SCIDS baby via the check assay pays for all of the testing for the entire year. The other issue is that once you have a screening assay that we know will have several false positive, is there a reliable and efficient confirmatory test? And of course, we can easily test for T and B cell subsets as well as function with flow cytometry in any laboratory setting. The other issue is that the actual ailment needs to cause serious medical disease and problems that we have the opportunity to intervene in. And as mentioned, SCIDS is a severe issue and is generally fatal by one year of age due to recurrent infections. There are also potentially several successful treatments, and the most common of which for the majority of conditions is a hematopoietic stem cell transplant, although alternate medications and potentially gene therapy for specific diagnoses exist. And the other issue is, does earlier intervention actually lead to 
an improved outcome? And this answer is a resounding yes for children with T cell deficiencies. If you're able to identify them earlier, you often can intervene with treatment and prevent the development of severe infections and other morbidity. The TREC assay itself is a relatively simple assay to run. It involves taking a small punch from the dry blood spot on the Guthrie card, processing that small punch and performing a detailed set of PCR analysis such that you can identify the presence of the TREX. The presence of the TREX in terms of numbers are then plotted against norms on a graph so that you can identify which infants fall below the expected norm. Once you have an abnormal TREC assay that's reported, most people would like to understand what happens next. The very first step is to actually simply repeat with another additional punch from the Guthrie card the TREC assay with the control, which is beta actin, just to make sure the test itself is functioning. If that test with the repeat beta actin is normal, no further action is needed, and a physician will actually never be contacted. Once the TREC assay is confirmed to be nor abnormal, the abnormal result is then called to the patient's primary care physician as well as the SCIG coordinator, which is currently housed at the Detroit Children's Hospital. During that conversation with the primary care physician and the SCIG coordinator, arrangements will be made for a complete blood count with differential as well as the confirmatory flow cytometry to be obtained within the next day or two. If the flow cytometry and the complete blood count are normal, that is the end of the evaluation and there is no further requirements. However, if they are abnormal, then the patient and the family will be referred to one of three testing centers within the state of Michigan designated by the state, which includes DeVos Children's Hospital, Detroit Children's Hospital, and the University of Michigan C.S. Mott Children's Hospital for further evaluation. There are several early management issues that need to be addressed as the patient and their family are undergoing workup. These early management issues cover isolation, fever management, blood products, vaccination, water source, breastfeeding, and infection prophylaxis. So the first early management issue is generally isolation. Patients with T cell deficiency should be isolated in a protective environment, whether that be at home or in the hospital, while a definitive diagnosis is being attempted. Consideration for this housing designation, whether it be home or in the hospital, should be based on an individual family need as well as the ability to rapidly confirm the diagnosis. Patients should not attend daycare if they are home or have contact with family pets or other animals. In addition, if patients have fever, they should be evaluated urgently in the pediatric emergency department as they are most likely to have a true illness. Blood products for patients with T cell deficiency are of great concern. While most of these patients will not be expected to require blood products, if they do, they must have irradiated leukopore CMV negative blood to minimize the chance of transfusion associated graft versus host disease and or CMV infection. Vaccinations also pose another issue. Live vaccines such as MMR, varicella, intranasal influenza, and the rotavirus should not be administered. While the other vaccines are not dangerous, they do not induce the desired protective effect and are generally not given. Household contacts, however, should receive all routine recommended vaccinations, including the MMR, varicella, and rotavirus. For influenza vaccinations of household contacts, the injection form is preferred. Water source should also be discussed with families. Patients should be dissuaded from using well water as there's an increased risk for infectious contamination, especially with giardia, and the parents should be instructed to boil the infant's water source. Breastfeeding, while encouraged, should be temporarily discontinued due to the risk of CMV transmission and infection and the potential risk of maternal T cell engraftment until the mother has been tested for CMV and found to be negative or the infant has been cleared from the flow cytometry screening and confirmatory testing. The mother should be encouraged to pump her breast milk and keep it frozen for later use after the evaluation is complete. Infection prophylaxis for these infants generally begins within a week or two which will include immunoglobulin replacement therapy with IVIG prior to the definitive treatment with a stem cell transplant and until the B cell function is restored. Additionally, the infants should also be started on PCP prophylaxis at approximately two to four weeks of age with Bactrim three days per week. Specific immunoglobulins 
such as varicella zoster and the cytomegala virus immunoglobulin should be provided to infants and children upon exposures. For any further questions regarding the check assay or other newborn screen related to T-cell deficiency, please call the M line at 1-800-962-3555 to speak directly to a University of Michigan expert or visit our immunohematology clinic website for more information.